going to explain about the, the normal gait and the common gait abnormalities. Um, when we are analyzing the gait, the normal gait, we have to consider one gait cycle. There are two terms that we have to consider. One is called the heel strike and the other one is the toe off. So the heel strike is the moment that, that your heel or uh, one of your heel is, 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 is touching the, the ground. This, this point is called heel strike. And the toe off stage is the moment that your toes are taking off the ground. So this moment is called toe off, and this moment is called heel strike. Uh, one gait cycle is, is the, 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 the time, starting time from, the, from one heel strike of one of the legs until the heel strike of the same leg in the next cycle, starting the next cycle. So, so one gait cycle technically starts from this point and then the person continues. Please don't look at this leg, just focus on this one. So until you continue walking until this point, the whole this, this step is called one cycle of gait. When we look at this cycle of gait, so from this point starting until we come back the same leg to this point, uh, there are two parts, there are two steps. The first step is from the start of heels, heel uh, strike until I put all the weight on the right side and then continue walking and until I am removing the weight from the right side, which is the toe off, this stage from this point to this point is called the stance stage. This is the part that I put the weight on one side. So this is the stance, stance, stance stage from this point to here. The moment the toe off starts until I continue and go to the heel stance, heel strike of the same leg, this is called swing stage. So the whole gait cycle for the right side has two parts. One is the stance part, and the other one is the swing part. I'll repeat again. So from here, the stance starts, stance, 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 and then here, swing, 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 and again, the new stance starts. Normally, for the normal gait, about 60% of, uh, of the gait cycle is the stance stage, stage, which is the time that I put weight on one side, and about 40% is the, um, the swing stage. So this is something that you have to consider. So when the person having the, like the normal walking, you ask them to, to just uh, have a bare feet, and ask them to walk five to 10 steps forward, you stand behind them, you look at them, and then ask them to come back. And you consider some of the key points for, for the gate. Um, uh, you, you just think about, you just look at the, each side, you see like, okay, the, the, the heel strike, uh, toe off stages, or is it like at the same time? Is it symmetric or is it not symmetric? You look at the, the, the hip, you look at the hip to see if the hip is, is level or not. The tilt of hip, about four to five degrees, and also rotation of hip about four to five degrees is normal uh, 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 within the normal gait. But if it's more than that, if it's too much tilt to one side or too much rotation to one side, that is considered abnormal, that we will discuss about it shortly. So, so the levelness of the hip is something important you have to consider. Um, the, the trunk and also the shoulders considered to be in the, in, the, in the same level the whole time of the gait. So you look at the trunk also, you see if the trunk is tilting to one side or not. You look at the shoulders, you see the shoulders are still in the same level and they don't move, they don't, there is no unleveling of the shoulders. And then the head is also is in the center or not.
These are the major points we consider during the uh, uh, normal gait assessment. Uh, uh, shortly, I'm going to show you the, the um, common abnormal uh, gaits that you will see in the clinic. Here I asked our model Mata to just help us to, to evaluate the normal gait. So what I do, I ask her to, uh, with the bare feet, to just walk uh, away from us and then come back. Just have the normal gait, try to be relaxed and uh, the way that you walk normally. And then just go like about 5 to 10 feet away from us and then come back. So just repeat this. Um, while we while she's walking, I look at the feet first of all. I look at the toe off and heel strike stages. I see if both sides are symmetric or not. And then uh, while she is going um, away from us, I look at the hip levelness, which I see. I don't see any abnormal rotation. I don't see any tilt here. Um, then I look at the shoulder levels. I see if the shoulders are staying in the same level or not, any rotation in shoulders, um, any trunk rotation, and then I look at the head level to see if there is any tilt or rotation uh, in the head and neck area. Um, the other thing we consider is the swinging of the arms, which uh, supposed to swing um, symmetrically on both sides, which for her, I don't see too much swings. So, which would be the style of her uh, gait. But if I see one side, there is a restriction in uh, swinging of the arms and the other side is normal swing. That is considered um, restriction on that side. While um, client is uh, walking and we look at the gait, um, if we have any uh, asymmetry in some area, that usually... Um, is due to two reasons. It's either because of restriction. Uh, restriction means because of the tightness or because of pain in some areas. Client has uh, restriction on one side. That causes asymmetry. Or it could be because of the weakness. If you have weakness in some areas, that might cause uh, also asymmetry. Um, I'm just going to, show you, I'm going to show you in this video uh, right away the common abnormal... Uh, gates that you will see in the clinic. I'm just going to go through the common uh, uh, gait abnormalities that you will see in the clinic. Uh, the first uh, gait that you will see is called uh, slap gate, or they call it steppage gate. Um, the steppage gate is the same as a slap gate, but it's more, uh, more uh, severe condition. So the, the slap gate and, and the steppage gate, both of them are due to the weakness or the full paralysis of the tibialis anterior muscle. So if this muscle doesn't work because of the muscle weakness or because of the nerve damages that go into this muscle, so you're going to have uh, the, the um, foot drop condition. But uh, while client has foot drop condition, cannot hold the foot in this position, um, what happens is during the gait uh, that uh, the foot will drop and will hit the floor and uh, that's why we call it a slap gate. So what, what happens, the client, let's say on the right side, the client has uh, this weakness. What happens, anytime the client uh, lifts the, 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 the foot from the floor, um, the uh, foot goes to this position, drop position, and then after when the client wanna just put the leg back, it's gonna be like very fast, it's happening, and that causes the sound of slap. So technically, the, the client walking like this, you can hear the sound of that. So the client goes back again like this, and then that's it. You can hear the sound. Um, the steppage gate is the same type of gate, but it's a little bit different. When you have the full paralysis of this muscle, if you have the co complete nerve damage, not partial nerve damage, for example, and then this, uh, the foot drop condition is, is, uh, is, is, is completed. There is no weakness here. So in that case, what happens is while client is walking, the, the toes are are just scratching on the floor and you can hear the sound. So you don't have like a, that the slap sound. What you have is like this. Client is walking like this, like this, and then sometimes you hear the slap as well, but this is like more uh, uh, like this condition that uh, the toes are, are, are kind of uh, scratching the floor. So this is called a step edge gate. So a step edge gate and a slap gate are kind of the same, very similar. 
The next uh, uh, common abnormal gait that you will see in the clinic is, is called uh, Trendelenburg's gait. Uh, Trendelenburg's gait or lurching is, is the gait that, that is caused uh, uh, by uh, a weakness of uh, the abductors of, uh, of the hip, which uh, mostly are two muscles here, gluteus maximus and minimus. Uh, the, the thing is that the action of these two, uh, uh, gluteus medius and minimus, so the action of these two muscles are uh, holding the hip in the, in the horizontal level, level while you, you're walking. For example, when I, in the normal gait uh, condition, when I walk, when I lift this uh, 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 foot from the floor, since there is no weight, uh, there is no leg supporting this side of the body, uh, you expect the hip to, to drop. But this never happens in the normal gait. The reason is that gluteus medius and minimus of this side, they become tight and contracted, and they hold the hip in the same level. So while you're walking, the hip doesn't tilt this side because the gluteus medius and minimus of this side are holding the hip. When you lift the other leg, the gluteus medius and minimus of this side are holding the hip. Now just imagine you have weakness of these muscles. If you have weakness of these muscles, let's say on the left side, my gluteus medius and minimus or abductors of the hip are weak. Why, when I lift the right, on the left side is weak, when I lift the right leg from the floor, because these muscles are not supporting my hip to hold my hip, what happens? My hip will tilt to the right side. So the, at the moment I lift my leg, this side goes downward. When this side goes downward, because my body doesn't like me to fall down to the right side, my trunk will deviate to the left side to hold my body in balance. So this is what you are noticing. While Klein is walking in Trendelenburg's gait or, or lurching, uh, you don't really notice the hip tilt because as soon as the hip is tilted to, to one side, the, the, the trunk or the body will deviate it to the opposite side to hold the balance. This is what you consider or you, you see in the gait when person walks. So, so the person, if the trunk is deviating to the left side, that means the, the, the muscles on the left side, the abductors are weak. So again, if this side is weak, the hip will tilt to this side, and then the trunk will go to the other side to keep the balance. So if I see this person is walking, usually what happens is uh, uh, the person is that the trunk, when I look at the body from, from the front or from the back, I see the body deviating to one side and coming back to the center. One side, coming back to the center. So what happens, just say we have a weakness of the left side. So this person is walking, is like this. Coming back like this, and then walking like that. So if someone has weakness of both sides, which is not very common, so technically you see the body deviating to one side and the other side. So technically we come like this, which that's not very common, but usually we see unilateral condition, which is one side going like this and coming back. This gait is called lurching or Trendelenburg's gait. Uh, the next gait that, uh, that is again common you see is called hemiplegic gait. Hemiplegic gait is, is seen in uh, patients who, who, were, excuse me, who went through a stroke. The, the stroke is, uh, is the damage of the brain on one side, uh, uh, the, the, mostly the frontal lobe that causing the uh, damage of the uh, 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 motor functions. So whatever side of the brain is damaged, usually the opposite side of the body going to the paralysis, we call it hemi hemiplegia, that causing the hemiplegic gait. What these patients do, uh, uh, they, the position they have, mostly the flexors of the upper limb are, are tight, so they are like in this position, let's say if, if the right side is hemiplegic, and then the extensors of the lower limb are paralyzed. So what they do, they are like this position, and then the knees, they cannot flex the knee because extensors are tight. So they are in this position in normal, normal standing, but while you ask them to walk, uh, uh, what they do is, because they cannot ex uh, flex the knee, they move the leg in a circle position and then just go to the next step. So what, what they do, technically they do this position. If you see the patient like this position, like this, with this gait, this is a typical gait of hemiplegia, that is, uh, that is uh, the gait that is, uh, 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 you can right away say this, this person went through the stroke 
And it can even can say what side of the brain is damaged. Usually it's the opposite side of the side is you see the paralysis. The other side, if you notice, if you put like a, like if you block this side of the body, you don't look at it, the other side totally has the normal swing and normal, normal walk. This walk is called hemiplegic gait. Uh, the next uh, abnormal gait uh, that you might see commonly in the clinic is it's called diplegic gait. Uh, di means two and plegic is, is paralysis. So diplegic usually is referred to, to the, uh, uh, the paralysis of two legs together. If someone has the full paralysis of two legs, including the hip area, usually they become uh, uh, wheelchair uh, dependent, so you don't really see them walking, so there's no point to consider their gait. But we're talking about the patient who has paralysis of the leg area, like the lower limb, and then he's not able to uh, 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 flex the knees, but the hip muscle is still functional. So this person still uh, 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 is, is able to walk with the hip flexors and extensors while the legs are not functional. So, so this person, usually the way you see the diplegic gait, this person is... Uh, is uh, uh, Flexing the body forward, like leaning, leaning the body forward to keep the balance, and then moves the legs like a, like a backward like this to push the body forward and continue the gait. So these patients, if you see them, they're like this. They, they usually uh, 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 move the chest forward again to keep the balance again. So legs are back, the body is forward to keep the balance. So these patients, they, they walk like this. If you see these patients, they usually, this, this is the gait, it's called diplegic gait. This is the gait that um, usually, uh, if this patient, they have uh, um, um, two legs paralysis. That is common in, in, in the damages of a spinal cord that causes the damage of, uh, of, from one point of the, of the spine and lowers so this full paralysis of the rest of the, the lower part of the body. So this is called diplegic gait. Uh, the other very common gait um, that you will see commonly in the clinic is called the uh, Antalgic gait. Uh, 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 the word algia means uh, means pain, and the word antalgia means uh, means uh, 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 no pain. Uh, this is a, a common gait because uh, for any reason, client has pain in the ankle area, knee area, thigh area, or the hip area. Uh, the person doesn't like to put weight on that side leg, so. Because of preventing this, uh, the client doesn't like to have the, the, the long uh, stand stage. Uh, and he would prefer to have the longer uh, uh, swing stage. Uh, if you remember, we talked about the stand stage is the time that you put the weight on the, the, the side, that leg. Um, uh, that's about 60% of your normal gait cycle. And swing is about 40%. These patients, they try to reduce the stand stage uh, as low as 30, 40 percent, and they increase the time of the swing stage that there is no weight on this leg. So these patients, uh, if you see like this side gait is kind of normal if you have pain on the, the right side, for example. So but the right side, uh, there is, you just try to shorten the, the stand stage. So this is, the, this is the way you see the gait they have. It's like this. They go like very short leg like this, and then, um, and then they just walk like this. This is called antalgic gait. It means the client trying to prevent uh, uh, the pain. So, so this is called antalgic gait. Usually this gait um, uh, is just telling you as a general information the client feels pain on this side, but this doesn't tell you the pain is in the ankle, knee area, or hip area. It could be any of them. Or it could be multiple points. So this is called antalgic gait. Um, the other gate, uh, 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 we call it a ataxic gate. Uh, the the um, ataxic gate is the gate that uh, is caused by the the damages of the um, of the uh, uh, cerebellum at the occipital part of the brain. So cerebellum is the area of the brain controls the balance, uh, equilibrium, and then uh, and then if the person has the damage of this. Uh, 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 area of the brain, they usually have the ataxic gait. Ataxic gait means lack of balance, uh, uh, or they call it uh, um, wide base gait. Because these patients don't have don't have balance, they usually um, keep their feet uh, uh, wider to keep the balance. Uh, what they do, these patients that uh, they they 
they always feel that they're falling down, and then uh, what, before they fall down, the other side of the uh, cerebellum pulling the body uh, uh, to the opposite side to make sure that uh, to make sure that keeping the balance. So this, and then holding the white gate, as I said. So this, they, they go like this. They go like this. This is like a typical gate. Also, you see in the patients they have uh, they, they they just drink alcohol, uh, like toxic alcoholic patients also have because alcohol will have uh, toxic effects in cerebe cerebellum and then blocks the actions of normal actions of cerebellum. That is, uh, this is called a taxi gate, or, or it's called the wide base gate. Yeah. The, the other gate that you will see commonly in, uh, in, uh, in Parkinson's patients, this is called Parkin Parkinsonian gate. This is the gate, or we call it hypokinetic gate. Uh, 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 the, 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 the client has uh, very short steps and slow, uh, uh, fast and, 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 and short steps. Uh, the reason is that in Parkinson patients, they have very tight muscles and the movements are bradykinetic, means they are very slow movement. Uh, they have adapted themselves to have uh, uh, the, the, the gait while they have these uh, small amount of movement and tight muscles. That's what, what they do. They just usually, uh, 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 again, uh, pull, move the body a little bit forward, lean it forward to, to keep the balance, but they have very, very short and fast steps. So these patients, and they, they, they have a position of the neck a little bit forward. What they do, they go like this. This patient like, has a very fast and, uh, and uh, uh, short steps. When they want to turn to one side, they cannot turn the whole body. They have to use these short steps to be able to, to turn to one side. They go like this, they go like this, and then turn, and then they continue to have this short step. This is a typical this is a typical gait in Parkinson's patients, or we call it hypokinetic. On the other side of the spectrum of, of, uh, of the hypokinetic movements, which is a, a, a small amount of move, uh, they provide, they, they have a gait while they have a little available movement, is a hyperkinetic movement, which is a typical gait, is called a choreiform gait. The, the patients, they have chorea, uh, uh, they, they usually have involuntary movements, uh, uh, and these involuntary movements, uh, uh, while they have gait, they continue to have these involuntary movements in the trunk or in the arm or in the legs. These involuntary movements doesn't cause them to fall down. Usually the client is still keeping the balance, but has all these movements. So you see like client is dancing, but this, all these movements are involuntary and not uh, in, under the control of the client. So these patients, they usually have movement of the arm and the movement of the body. They just continue like that. They have all these movements and then they stop. And then after they just turn back like this, and then they continue. So this is this is a typical uh, a gate for hyperkinetic gates, or we call it we call it the Corey form gate. I hope you enjoyed the 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 the, the uh, 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 illustration of these uh, uh, common abnormal gates that you will see in the clinic. Thank you.